wish you all the graces possible. So please do pay your respects to our Lord, the infant king in the crib, because remember you receive graces when you do so, as though you were there at our Lord's actual birth a few thousand years ago. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. <clears throat> Dear faithful, we invoke our blessed mother with this Hail Mary, she who is there ever at the side of our Lord, a sure guide, a loving mother who guides us to her son. So we pray to her to help us, to guide us to the king, the king of kings, the sacred heart of Jesus. I wish to speak to you, to maybe perhaps teach you a little bit more about our relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ. And this through the holy sacrifice of the mass. Our Lord born in time, a few thousand years ago, born into time, he was born through the Blessed Virgin Mary and he appeared in time. He was a revelation to souls and what a great gift that was for people to actually see God in the flesh. We'd heard about God, they had even been spoken to by God out of clouds and out of all kinds of different manifestations, but this, the coming of our Lord, was a great act of mercy and love, to make himself tangible, to make himself visible, to make himself a victim to suffer. So a great revelation to us as he appeared in time from the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary by the power of the Holy Ghost. And you know that this happens at the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, the presence of our Lord on the altar, through the words of the priest, instituted by our Lord Jesus Christ himself. And all of this under the guidance of the Blessed Virgin. So there are a lot of parallels today that we can draw, that being the first one, the appearance of our Lord in our midst. But I wish to draw attention in particular to the flesh, I've spoken to you before about how it is we must purify ourselves to approach the sacrifice. Any one of you who's read the Old Testament knows all about how much emphasis was put upon the flesh, the sacrifice of the flesh, the sacrifice of all of these victims, multiple, multiple victims, cows and goats and sheep. A lot of emphasis upon the flesh, very carnal, very bloody. And here again, we talk about the flesh of our Lord at the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. But all of that is in view of what? Of our Lord Jesus Christ coming. Him, God, taking flesh. Isn't that interesting? So much emphasis in the Old Testament upon the carnal flesh. And here we have God taking flesh, becoming man. In a way, and certainly it's the case, of raising us up, taking all those, let's say, very material aspects and raising them to a higher level, making them much more important, and getting away from the bloody carnal aspect, even so much so that he wanted his apostles and all of us to eat of his flesh and his blood through the appearance species of bread and wine that was changed in its substance, but not in its appearance, because we meant, were meant to get higher, move higher than simply this bloody carnal aspect, which was so full of meaning in the Old Testament. So I want you to think about this whole question of the flesh, because we find ourselves there today. All of us are so impressed by the flesh we see it all around us. It's paraded all around us in all the billboards and movies, magazines. The flesh, the flesh. Always crying out. Always influencing us. Always tearing us down. So 
So our Lord's coming this particular year, Christmas 2022, is meant to draw us out of the flesh, this worldly and carnal attitude and spirit that we have all over the world. It's not just here in the United States, it's everywhere. So what are we going to do? We have to take this body, as we say in the spiritual life, this donkey has to be transformed. It has to follow the soul. It has to be perfected. And how is that going to happen? We can't get away from it. We can't separate ourselves. We're not angels. What are we willing to do? What could we do to bring this flesh into subjection to the spirit, subjection to the soul, subjection and rule of Christ? St. Paul talks about it a little bit, doesn't he, in the epistle of today for Christmas. He says, the grace of God our Savior hath appeared to men, instructing us that denying ungodliness and worldly desires, we should live soberly and justly and godly in this world, looking for the blessed hope and coming of the glory of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. That's really the whole goal of this life. He came into flesh to give us the example that this flesh can be ruled. This flesh can be sanctified. This person whose body and soul can go to heaven. We must not despair of that. But rather get a, take the bull by the horns. With all its weaknesses of character, all of its weaknesses of health, Take that bull by the horns and say, it's going to serve Christ. This soul and this body is going to do something great for Christ. The man who limps, the man who's laying in his bed, the man who never seems to be able to do anything because he's somehow inhibited, can do great things if he'd only give it to Christ. He has to make an offering of his flesh to Christ to make a sacrifice. We hear even there in the collect of today, the prayer of the Mass, O God who has made this most holy night to shine forth with the splendor of true light, grant we beseech thee that we who have known the mysteries of his light on earth may enjoy also his happiness in heaven. There is a purpose why our Lord came to this life as a man he became man, the incarnation. It's because he's dealing with us. He wouldn't have done all that for the angels. He chose to take flesh, not to become an angel. So we will do our part. Wouldn't we have to admit that in this day and age, the thing that seems to keep us most distracted is what kind of chair we're going to sit on, what kind of bed we lie on, what kind of car we drive, how comfortable we are. All the time we're thinking about that. What temperature is it? And then yet it's distracting. And our souls aren't grasping the truth. Think about it, faithful. Think about how hard it is to say your prayers. Why is that? Because we ate too much. We don't get any exercise. We overslept. Or we didn't sleep. And we can't pray. The body is always doing that to us. We want to become more spiritual. We want to be more perfect. We want to be closer to our Lord. And yet, and yet, and yet, the body always works against us. It's quite the cross. So here we are at the Mass, and we're trying to look around for an answer. How do I answer this? How do I answer this flesh that always wants to tear my soul down, always like an anchor? You have to offer it at the Mass. You have to take your whole self, body and soul, and offer it to our Lord Jesus Christ at the Mass, he who is flesh also. He who offers his body and soul to God. When the priest offers up this flesh, the host, and he offers up the blood, the wine, 
This all is him offering to his father. And we can join him. He's inviting us to join him and offer everything that we have at the same time on the patent in the chalice. That's the true answer. And it's amazing how the Mass transforms the whole person. We know that Holy Communion received, we are transformed and made like Christ. But there's something else missing if we don't go to Mass. Yes, we could be transformed into Christ, we could receive our Lord at the Communion rail, but there's still something I haven't done. I've taken, I've taken. That's the Holy Communion. But what have I given? And that's the Mass. To give of myself to give of everything I own to the Mass, to the Holy Sacrifice. That's fulfilling. That's complete. That is the consummation. We have to give. We have to give, dear faithful. Otherwise, the flesh says, mine, mine. It's always looking for pleasure. It's always looking for selfishness. And I want to read to you something that Father de Chivre says in his book, the book called The Mass of Pius V. The Mass of Pius V was published by the seminary years ago, translated from the French of Father de Chivre, a Dominican. And he says, selfishness will ever remain the great enemy of the salvation of the world. Whatever form we give to it, selfishness represents a miserliness of existence, which is so much the opposite of the reasons for which God gave existence to us. Selfishness that is such that it closes the floodgates of mercy and determines God to remain silent. When we are selfish in our flesh, we cause God to be silent with us. We shut the floodgates of mercy. Yet in the Mass, the offertory itself reminds us of the great law of salvation. Generosity without discussion. Generosity without discussion. Oh, God, you give me a little of this, I'll give you a little bit of that. Oh, well, not so good, not so great. No, none of that. I give to you. You take it, God will always take it, whatever we give to him, hoping that it's the best that we give to him, the most of ourselves, what we call our treasure. Don't renege on that, don't be stingy. Give to him the best of yourself. That's where vocations come from. Vocations to the priesthood, vocations to the married life, vocations to the religious life comes from this generosity of giving oneself completely. And then we wonder why we have less priests and religious today. Because we live in the flesh. We live in selfishness. And it just closes us down to God's mercy, closes us down, and God is silent with us. You see how God spoke and speaks so well through the saints, those who are very generous with him. If you want to take the example of Padre Pio, the Curie of ours, St. Teresa of Arbila, St. Teresa of the Child Jesus. These souls were generous with our Lord. And he did wonderful things with them. And he was not silent, even sometimes speaking to them personally. Why doesn't that happen more often with us? Because we live in the flesh. And our ears close. And we get tired and dull and blind. Not a good way to live. Not a very happy way to live. Better to take all of that and just go right to Mass and say, Jesus, take it all from me. It's the most I can offer you. And then we come away winners, happy, complete, consummated. It all began in Nazareth town in the home of a humble virgin when angels' wings brushed Mary's face as he bent down to whisper. A startled Mary bowed her head and with one word changed the world forever, fiat. She said, angels in heaven straining to hear her word rushed backward with folded wings to make room for the word. In one eager ecstatic bound, the sun leaped down and hid in the Virgin Mary. 
It all happened quickly, an angel's message, a girl's consent, and the hidden life began. Slowly, gently, secretly, he fashioned his body, a masterpiece no eye could see, and just as surely as he knew and nerve, muscle and organ developed, he called from his hiding place. John heard and leaped for joy. They continued their conversation in secret. Joseph did not understand, and confused and hurt, he turned away. Again, silently, the son called his angel. Go tell Joseph, it is time for him to know. Then Joseph understood, but said not a word. His hiding place was safe. Safe even on the road to Bethlehem, when caravans passed him by. No one suspected Mary was hiding God. Nine months and God's self-portrait was finished. Mary brought forth his hiding place, from his hiding place, the Son of God. But oh, how God loves secrets, how he loves the game of hide and seek. So he continued to hide. Men saw a baby, a child, a youth, a man. Never once suspecting this humanity was hidden and hiding God. Never once suspecting that sad and glorious day when they hung him on a tree, that they had crucified their God. And even then, when the earth could keep the secret no longer and shook with the awful knowledge of what had been done, men didn't see. God's hiding place knew, Mary knew, but she was used to keeping secrets. So she watched silently as they placed him in another hiding place, so unlike herself. She knew it would not hold him long. Even her womb had given up its secret. So too would the tomb. But would he go on hiding? On Easter morn, he left his hiding place, but not his hiddenness. Only a blessed few saw and believed. Mankind is so blind. Angels welcome back their God in the human form, rejoicing to have known the secret all along. But what's this? In consternation, the angels flap their wings. He is going back to earth again to hide. Peering down from the edge of their heavenly home, they see a new hiding place. Nay, many hiding places. They watch in awe as man after man, woman after woman, child after child, take him into their hearts, forming new hiding places for their God. They gasp, spellbound as they see his priest lock him in a little gold box. Can this really be? Is there no end to his hiding? The son smiles at their angelic approval as they suddenly realize the meaning of his words, seek and you shall find. The game of hide and seek goes on, never to end until eternity begins. That's the wonderful poem of Sister Imelda Kaufman or Sister Imelda of the Blessed Sacrament, who recently died, a Franciscan in Kansas City. Perhaps those words will help us also to be less blind, more alive to God's grace on this Christmas morning. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen.